Schrodinger again, who talked about entanglement for the first time, and it's more like um, like uh, something like that is like intertwined kind of thing. The word apparently I don't speak German, but I've been told by German people. <laughs> Quantum entanglement, though. Um, it's the name that we know it in English by. So it's just a kind of correlations. So let's understand classical correlations. Imagine that I have a black ball and a white one, okay? And I put them in a ball, in a bag, and I grab one at random, and then I give the, the bag to you. So I say, okay, keep the bag. I'm not going to look at the bag. I just grab one. And then I look at it. I say, it's white. I'm going to guess what color is yours. It's going to be black. And then you look into the bag and say, yeah, it's black. Genius. Because, of course, if you put in a black and a white ball to begin with, if you take the white one, what's left is the black one, correct? Makes sense. That's called classical correlations. There were correlations between the color of the two balls. It, basically, the correlation says one is white, the other one is black. Okay? So, quantum entanglement is a little bit like follows. Imagine two sets of quantum dice, like two quantum random number generators that are entangled. I put them in the bag, and then I pick one set at random, and I leave the other one in the bag. You take the bag wherever you want, and then I, I, I throw the, my set, right? And then I got a 10, and then I tell you, you're going to get a 10 when you throw yours. And then you go grab it, throw it, it's a 10. Yeah, you go lucky. Okay, let's repeat it. Not with the same dice, with different set of dice. So let's repeat it. Now you're going to get an 8, and you get an 8. That kind of thing, that kind of correlations, does not exist in classical theory. Okay? However, the classical, I know nothing about the outcome of the dice, right? But quantumly, if the dice is in an entangled state, two people throwing the dice can get the same result, actually correlated. And then, the big worry is because of this claim, right? The Copenhagen interpretation tells us the first person, person who actually measures collapses the state of the dice and therefore affects the dice of the other guy. It couldn't be more wrong, but that's still what you hear in popular science all the time, or many times anyways, like action at a distance. There's no such thing as a spooky action at a distance, all right? That doesn't exist, uh, that, that we know of, all right? So that is not really, that's not really the way it works. The way it works is, remember, because if that were true, and then you can understand Einstein, remember that what happens first depends on the observer. So if I ask you, Oh, who measured first? Alice measured first and collapsed the state of Bob. But a different observer would actually see Bob measuring first. And for that other observer, it's Bob who collapsed the state of Alice. So who collapsed who? Well, no one collapsed any one state, all right? That's a very handy way of doing math, but it's very shut up and computish, which I don't like at all. Okay, it's not explained. What really happens, so instantaneous action is incompatible with relativity. What really happens is that there are correlations there that tells me even regardless of who measures first, I know that your outcome will be correlated with yours, no matter who does it first. That's the kind of thing we actually have. Okay? It's not the action of one. It's before anyone measuring, I know already, that whatever you measure, he's going to get the same. Whenever you measure. Okay? That's the way it works. There's no action at a distance. Questions so far? Yes. I have a question on, on the Schrodinger's cat. Uh, is, is that cat not considered an observer? No. The cat is a quantum system. It's a state. Uh, but why is it not considered an observer? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, uh, the cat cannot make measurements. The cat is in a box. No, I mean, a, a, cat, <laughs> a cat already knows whether or not he's alive or dead. No, think of a cat with... Uh, maybe we're being cruel to cats already. So think of a cat that you actually play with his brain so that he's never aware of that. <laughs> the key point is we put it in a box. Thinking of a cat is just an example. Schrodinger like cats or didn't. I don't know what exactly. But you can think of something else. Okay? Any, any system that could be two different states. A coin that is heads or tails. Oh, no. Okay? Cat is actually kind of cool when you throw it through double slits because they try to resist. But other than that. <laughs> anyway, what happens also so that actually is what, what actually the, the, the problem with, is relativity really compatible with quantum theory? The answer in the end was yes, it is compatible. You need to do it right. To do relativity and quantum theory at the same time, you cannot do it simply. You need to do something called quantum field theory in the end. I mean, just summarizing a story, story of about 35 years, 40 years, and even more if you want. Anyway. It so happens that entanglement is a useful thing, right? A thing. You may have heard about quantum computers and the promise of uh, an immense amount of computing power when we can build those, right? You've heard that, no? Yeah. And it may actually happen. 
one day. Okay, you can tell that it will happen when Google just starts throwing money at it. <laughs> so it will definitely happen. Anyway, so here's where the field of relativistic quantum information comes in. So relativistic, relativistic quantum information is, if you want, the superposition, no, just kidding, it's actually classical superposition, it's not quantum, of general relativity, quantum field theory, and quantum information. All right, so there are two ways in which you use relativistic, or you work on relativistic quantum information. Way number one, use relativistic approaches to do more in quantum information processing. So we all know that uh, classical computing people would tell you, yeah, quantum is bad. Why? Because when we're building microchips and we're integrating them to like 20 nanometers, we start getting electrons or whatever carriers of charge I use jumping from cable to cable because they tunnel through. They can do that in quantum mechanics. You can go through a door without opening or breaking it. You can do that, no problem. So you get electrons or carriers of charge, whatever, jumping from cable to cable. And that is bad, it introduces noise. So engineers in IBM, in Intel, and in many other places, they were already using quantum mechanics in the way they used this formula-wise. They got correction factors, but only as sources of noise, something bad. But then people arrived and said, look, no, actually, if instead of considering noise, if you're clever about it, you can do better things with quantum theory, taking advantage of it instead of considering a parasitic kind of thing. Well, how about relativity? You know, many people do quantum information with light, for example, states of what they call photons, right? But then they neglect the whole relativistic model. They don't, they don't actually use relativity at all. They treat it as a quantum mechanical non-relativistic system. But light is actually usually travels close to the speed of light, no? So in principle, it makes sense that if we actually consider the full extent of the problem, we can do better things. We can manipulate things if we have access to quantum information, sorry, to relativistic tools to do quantum information. And the other one, study the structure of space-time and the quantum nature of gravity via quantum informational tools. So quantum information has a lot to teach and a lot to say to how these theories actually work together. If you ask a particle physicist about that, they don't care about localization. After all, they work with systems that exist forever, interact forever, and live forever at the same time. Yes, well, live everywhere at the same time, forever in the relativistic kind of way. Okay, so uh, what happens if you actually want to contain information? When if you have to contain information, then you start having issues with localization. And when you localize, it costs you energy to localize things, and energy curves space-time. So these three things, interact a lot, and in particular, people working on my field, and on the field of quantum relativistic quantum information, believe that we can say a lot of things about this. And I think many people are jumping on already in many different other fields to this, this bit. Very knowledgeable people. So just some examples of things that one can do with quantum information. These are the two legs. You can talk about many of them. I had a couple of examples here to talk if there's still like 10 minutes. How much time do I have? Is there a time limit? Okay, cool. So let's do a couple of things where this is relevant. Like very quickly, you've heard about the black hole information paradox? How many of you have heard about it? Okay, so here's the thing. By the way, this is Earth orbiting a solar mass black hole. That's the way much closer though to the, what we are right now. And this is the way you would see it. In fact, hiding behind a black hole, bad idea. You're always visible. You can say you'll never hide because light actually is bent around you even when you're behind and people see you actually see double images that the gravitational lensing effect right there. Anyway, that's a real simulation, by the way. Anyway, so imagine, so let's try to understand a little bit how entanglement shows up in a stellar collapse, all right? So imagine that you have nothing at all. So something that, that state represents nothing if you want, okay? And it looks a little bit like this. All right? <laughs> and then you can have actually, instead of nothing, some stellar dust and then a gravitational collapse and so on. But let's just create a black hole. So imagine to simplify things, a force, an extremely powerful force capable of generating stellar collapse. So something like that. All right? And then <laughs> suddenly you get a black hole out of nothing. Okay? So you have. The closest to nothing that you can be when you have a quantum field, which is what we call the vacuum state of the field, no quanta, no photons, and then suddenly you created that, something like that. Now, what happened to the field? Initially in the vacuum, what happened now? So, 
has a kind of misleading picture, but it's at the level I'm talking, it could be good to understand. So the vacuum in the far past, if you have nothing at the beginning, then someone comes and generates a black hole, the vacuum evolves to something like that. From nothing to something, if you want. That something is splitting two somethings. A something that falls into the event horizon and something that actually reaches the asymptotic future, something that escapes the horizon. So many times, this was Hawking who came up with this kind of way of visualizing. If you have an observer, I promise I like cats. So if you have an observer at infinity, an observer at infinity sees the creation of the horizon and it sees something coming off the horizon, the way he would look at it. So in particular, so we, only, we do not see whatever falls into the horizon, we actually see whatever reaches the future, if we are there safely at the future, of course. So, in particular, what we see is outgoing radiation. So trust me, for now, I guess you have to trust me, that you can actually check that the quantum state of the radiation that reaches the field, let's say electromagnetic field, that reaches the asymptotic future, is actually thermal radiation, outgoing thermal radiation. So in fact, what is it? Yeah, in fact, you can actually use a black hole to heat yourself up <laughs> if you're in the vastness of space. Okay, well, not quite. You can use the microwave background, and then if that fails, go to a black hole. Anyway, so a black hole emits thermal radiation, and the temperature associated with that radiation is what we call Hawking's temperature that you guys probably know about. Okay, so black holes actually are not that black. They have some temperature, and they emit radiation. And they're actually pretty unstable in the sense that if you guys have taken any thermal courses, it's got negative heat capacity, meaning that the more energy it emits, the hotter it gets. That's what we call negative heat capacity, all right? So it wants to evaporate, starts evaporating, and then it goes faster, 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 and at the end it explodes, all right? So a moon-size moon size black hole would actually explode in 15 minutes. It releases mc squared, where m is the mass of the moon, in 15 minutes. Can you, you can count the energy of that, and then you can laugh at the atomic bomb. Anyway, uh, by the way, uh, XKCD in the what if section once talks about what happened if the moon gets transformed into a black hole, and he says nothing, and he argues, yeah, it may have evaporated, but it doesn't because the temperature of that is the same as the more or less the cosmic background, so it will reach equilibrium. That is wrong. So yeah, that Randall Munro sometimes gets wrong things. So that is actually wrong because of what I told you, negative heat capacity, that means it's an unstable equilibrium. So it's definitely at equilibrium, but the fluctuations will actually drive it out of equilibrium and it will explode anyways because of the negative heat capacity. So you have a fluctuation of positive energy coming in, and that fluctuation wah, gets it, sorry, coming out, and that fluctuation just gets it wild, no matter hotter than the background radiation, and it would explode. So yeah, we would notice if the moon <laughs> becomes a black hole. That would be the last thing we actually notice. <laughs> okay. So, if we believe in quantum, so the problem with creation of event horizons, it's also the fact that if we believe in quantum theory, information cannot be lost. What does that mean? If we believe the world is quantum, then one of the principles of quantum theory is that evolution is unitary, and then the norm of the vectors representing state cannot be lost because unitary transformations preserve the norm. And Born's rule tells us that the norm of those vectors is probability, and therefore you cannot lose probability, and in particular, you cannot lose information. So, well, right, so maybe after corrections, the outflow of the black hole might not be entirely thermal. Like, it's the same when we burn a piece of charcoal. When we burn a piece of charcoal, right, what we're doing, we have light, which is in a pure state. We have charcoal, which is in a pure state, say absolute zero. We heat it up with a laser. We heat it up to some um, amount of temperature and the charcoal starts radiating, and we know we started from a pure state, and we end up with a mixed state because we're missing the radiation. That means that the radiation emitted by the charcoal cannot be thermal. Well, here's a proposal. Don Page, Canadian physicist, proposed, uh, one of the students, one of the first generation of students of Stephen Hawking. Um, what, if, what if black holes are like pieces of charcoal? What if at some point they emit, so this is, the entropy that you get in the black hole if it keeps emitting thermal radiation, and what if it just keeps emitting thermal radiation until some point, and then it emits the information that it swallowed. So it swallowed information. So that's the point, right? Thermal radiation contains no information. In fact, thermal 
is the smallest amount of information that you can have for a given amount of energy. So, the highest entropy that you can have for a given amount of energy. So, uh, if it's only emitting thermal radiation and you throw, I don't know, something with information, I don't know what, uh, textbook or something like that, you throw it to a black hole, where did that information go if all that comes out is thermal up until the end? Well, Page says, well, what if it's not, right? What if actually the black hole at the middle of its life, so it doesn't become quantum, something like at the middle of its life, it starts spitting out radiation, uh, information as opposed to thermal radiation. So, fine, that would solve the problem of losing information, but that could be even worse. Why so? Well, I told you before, I didn't say, but I told you before that the radiation, so we have three kinds of radiation here. The one emitted after page time, the one emitted before page time, and the radiation that falls into the horizon. And I told you before that the radiation emitted, uh, uh, sorry, the informing radiation and the radiation emitted before page time are entangled. They have quantum entanglement. And uh, the infalling radiation, so if page, if page is correct, what should happen is that the, the outgoing radiation in late times should be entangled with the outgoing radiation at late times. And there's some property of entropy, entanglement entropy, well entropies in general, which is subadditivity, that leads to the following inequality in entanglement. It tells me that the entanglement between A and B and the entanglement between A and C together cannot be larger than the entanglement that A has with B and C. And therefore, if in the limit where the black hole evaporates, if I am maximally entangled between infalling radiation and radiation emitted after page time, I cannot be at the same time, the radiation cannot be at the same time entangled with C. Okay, with the radiation emitted before. So, those two things are at odds. And how do we solve that? Several possible options. People for a while came up. So, Leon, Leonard Saskin came up with something called um, um, uh, black hole complementarity. Okay, the black hole complementarity was about well, the degrees of freedom living inside are actually not no different from the degrees of freedom living outside. Maybe black holes, the inside of a black hole is actually the same as the outside of a black hole. Some topological identification between the inside and the outside, kind of clever, kind of proven wrong too, after some time by these guys. Okay, so people came up with other possible ideas. Those are all crazy ideas, waving hands, a lot of waving hands, very few calculations. And solution one, what they call firewalls. What is firewalls? Yeah, let's just destroy this guy. Because, so you said that, 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 yeah, the radiation that falls and radiation that comes out are entangled. What if we make that zero? It works, right? Well, yeah, in that case, what we have is the charcoalization of the black hole, down page, model, and everything works, all right? And then the price you pay is that you have something funny happening at the horizon. Something funny as in a divergent stress energy tensor, as in something that would burn you if you cross. Now, those of you who have taken GR, or those of you who have taken GR will see it in the future, we will see that <coughs> nothing should happen at the horizon. There's nothing special about the horizon, actually. So that's a very radical hypothesis. And then, actually, people, people that violence at the horizon is actually called drama. Uh, in fact, the absence of a firewall is called a no drama, and I'm no kidding about that. So people have criticized that. Uh, we do in math sometimes. So I've done it, for example, with other people, and not the only one. Other people have done it as well. Masahiro Hota, the guy who invented uh, quantum energy teleportation, and many others. So the point is that this is all very hand wavy, and when you do math, everything starts to explode. So how can we actually address the problem? Well, the problem requires the study of quantum information quantum information together with relativity. And to finish, I guess I'll tell you about one last thing. Okay, so the one last thing is called entanglement harvesting. So I know some people here that are actually working on it, which is kind of cool. So entanglement harvesting, think of the following. Imagine that you have two atoms, right? And then you say, okay, I want them entangled. So if you have atom one and interacts with a quantum field, say the electromagnetic field on the background, and interacts with the electromagnetic field, and then another atom is connected by a light signal, so they're light connected, you can say, oh yeah, they get entangled because they exchange photons, so that's possible. How about if you start from something like that? You get two atoms that are space-like separated, 
They cannot know about the existence of each other at all. However, they interact with the field. In fact, with the vacuum state of the field, these guys are in the ground state. There is really nothing behind this. It's the ground state, no photons if you want. And these guys in the ground state, they interact with the field and they still get quantum entangled. They acquire correlations, even though they don't talk to each other. So that's called entanglement harvesting. So in particular, you get two mechanisms, two mechanisms of entanglement harvesting. Sorry, two mechanisms of getting two things entangled. So think of the following. In mind that I have a lattice okay, of harmonic oscillators coupled together. And then I couple two harmonic oscillators A and B locally. <laughs> right? And then they can communicate. So how do I get them entangled? So this, this is a resource theory problem in, that, in the sense that I'm given a problem, get A and B entangled. Tools, a lattice of harmonic oscillators in the ground state. Possible ways to communication via photons, if you want, or phonons, exchange of vibrations, right? So they kind of know about each other and they get entangled. And they end up in an entangled state. And of course, this is limited by the speed of sound because it requires the exchange of information between them. How about this other method? The ground state of the chain of harmonic oscillators contains quantum correlations, and it cannot be otherwise, because you know we have two bases, two natural bases for this, the basis of normal modes, which is what you do to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, for those of you who have taken courses in quantum. And then the local basis, the basis of every individual oscillator. There are two different bases that span the same Hilbert space, the Hilbert space of all the possible states of harmonic oscillators here. Well, if you actually look at I and J, and you trace out the rest, it so happens that I and J are entangled. So what you can do is swap that entanglement to your atoms. You locally interact with the lattice, and you see no A sees, sees noise, A knows nothing about B. In fact, B might as well not exist for A, because A doesn't know anything about B, cannot figure out. B, the same thing, they don't know about each other. However, they see noise, the noise is correlated in a way that it can get them entangled. So you can actually get things entangled, even though they never know the other existed, they're not in like contact. All right? And then, I guess the last one thing that I want to say, another cool kind of result that I work on, uh, called quantum correct calling. So if you think of wireless communication, which is kind of trendy, right? Uh, how do we communicate through massless fields, such as the electromagnetic field, for example? So some possible ideas. Communication is mediated by real energy carrying quanta. So an emitter emits photons, a receiver captures photons, right? Makes kind of sense. You need to emit energy, and the other person receives energy and receives the message. Exactly this. Information is carried by an energy flow. You need, even Suskin in his book says, it, there's no way to communicate if you don't send energy. Information reaches you when energy reaches you. Right? Also, communication is only possible at the speed of light in vacuum. Of course, no faster. It's a relativistic theory. But also not slower because it so happens it so happens that light travels at the speed of light. So if I get an empty chair and I beam it with a laser pointer, right? the empty chair, the, the, the laser beam goes and flies by. If someone comes three hours later and sits there, will that person be able to recover the message? What do you think? No, because it's gone, right? Light is gone. You can only communicate at the speed of light. So if you miss the beam, you miss the message. So under some circumstances that are relevant, we can actually prove you know, that all those restrictions only at the speed of light through the exchange of real quanta, carried by energy, and if you miss the beam, you miss the message, that's actually not true. So in fact, not true in general. In fact, if you use quantum antennas, you can actually have time-like communication with massless fields. So I'm not going to get into the technical details because I'm running out of time, but let me just show you, in particular in cosmology, in 3 plus 1 flat space-time, you cannot do it. But in any dimensional space with even number of dimensions of four space, and also in most curved space, for example, the one we live in, cosmological curved space, you can actually get time-like signaling through something called the violations of the strong Huygens principle. So in particular, this is kind of the sensational headline that some people wrote about our work. Actually, the one, the original one said weird echoes, but in the published version, they replaced it with ancient. So the main idea is, let me just go and skip the technical details, that you actually can communicate, can communicate 
in time-like separation. So here your space like separated. This is your channel capacity in bits per second. That's what your phone will register as megabits per second if you want. Only tinier, but no matter. It's still a channel capacity. And you get zero for space like separation, but non zero when you're time like if you do it in a particular way. And why people why didn't people realize of that? Because people that were studying propagation in quantum fields, they were not studying transmission of information. People studying transmission of information, they did definitely not study relative, uh, quantum field theory in curved space times. So this is the power of relativistic quantum, uh, relativistic quantum information. Let me just leave you with this diagram, which is kind of nice. This, uh, these are the, the local light cones in an Alcubierre world drive. So I promise to you that general relativity may allow faster than light traveling. True in that sense. So those are the light cones as you guys can see. They're very tilted. They actually cross the 45 degrees. You can construct, in principle, a world drive. And actually, using quantum informational tools, you can actually prove that you can stabilize them and that you can actually build something like a quantum, like a, like a world wire or something like that. They were forbidden by principle. So they were works that actually forbid the construction of world drives because of several things. The amount of energy that you need, you need negative energy densities, and you need also uh, a lot of it, actually, you need so much energy that is more than matter there is in the universe to hold a spaceship. And the main thing is that it's also unstable. When it reaches superluminal regimes, you're kind of trumping all the modes of light propagating to the right. So you start accumulating energy in front of you, and that thing curves space time and destroys you again. Okay? But uh, you can actually stabilize it. So you can have, you can have, so yeah, you can have a starship and it will last for a nanosecond, so not great with so much exotic matter, which is more than the mass in the universe, it's solar masses, 10 to the 32, mass in the observable universe. However, if you, actually, if you actually, instead of being so ambitious, you actually want just to have a warp channel, so a wire that is, say, a one Fermi, enough to send information. And also, and also if you actually get the word drive jittering, you can actually stabilize it. You, know, you don't want to be around that word drive, <laughs> All right, but you can stabilize it, it becomes stable, and in principle, you can actually send information with that. So, let me just finish saying goodbye with this nice picture of light cones, which I think is actually great. <laughs> Thank you.